GM und herzlich willkommen zu Episode 30 von Kryptoticker, der Podcast. In dieser Folge spreche ich mit dem DJN Lawyer Yitzi Hammer. Und bevor ihr jetzt denkt, Law, hm, das könnte trocken und langweilig werden, lasst mich da direkt einhaken, denn diese Folge ist wirklich alles andere als langweilig. Yitzi ist spezialisiert auf Fragestellungen rund um das Legal Setup von Crypto Companies. Also je nach Produkt, Komplexität, Umfang und weiteren Aspekten erarbeitet er gemeinsam mit seinen Kunden individuelle Legal Strukturen, um ihnen das bestmögliche Setup zu ermöglichen. Er hat deshalb auch wirklich ziemlich spannende Meinungen rund um DAOs, den politischen Crackdown gegenüber Krypto in den USA und einiges an Erfahrung. Das Ding lohnt sich also wirklich. Also direkt rein und viel Spaß mit Jitsi Hammer. Welcome, Jitsi. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for joining me at Crypto Ticket the Podcast. Um, you are a lawyer, if I'm not wrongly informed, right? No, I'm a lawyer. You're not wrongly informed. I'm based out of Tel Aviv. Um, I run a practice called DLT Law, which stands for Distributed Te Technology, Ledger Technology Law. And our practice is focused predominantly on the blockchain crypto sector. We do regulatory compliance um, on a multi-jurisdictional level, you know, throughout uh, U.S. markets, Asian markets, European markets, and we do legal advising as well. Um, basically, working with anybody with a nexus to the space, so like investors, crypto companies, exchanges. We do we assist with listings and legal opinions, um, structured DAOs, and other um, governance. Um, mechanisms and you know really are just try to be as active as possible in the space and uh, since when are you by yourself in that space um so i've been in crypto i would say in some variation or another since 2016 um and then it escalated in 2018 during like the whole um ico bubble where we launched like many 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 um, companies and did their ICOs. I was working for a, uh, a large law firm in Israel at the time, Herzog Fox Neman, the largest law firm in Israel. Um, and then like my, my background is more on the commercial IP corporate side. But I was working very closely with the, with the financial regulation department. Um, and together with my now partner, uh, Samuel, we started this practice, DLT Law, that focuses on this industry, recognizing that Even the large um, and very excellent firms in the space, both in Israel and in the U.S. and in other markets as well, aren't necessarily as well informed with what's going on in this industry and as regulation develops and um, even just how the technology and the products work. Even like a standard service agreement with somebody in the space when you're paying in crypto has... Um, Uh, different implications than like a regular standard service agreement. So even just basically understanding how these products work is something that I found most law firms aren't familiar with. Um, we try to be really um, active within this space, both in terms of being, coming to these type of conferences and speaking and proliferating as much knowledge and understanding of the industry as possible, but also ourselves as consumers. So there's not an exchange that I haven't traded off of no wallet that I haven't opened myself and felt it. And, you know, when NFTs were more interesting, like I aped into so many really shitty products. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, like my, my, uh, the web domain for my website is dgenlawyer.xyz. So like I'm, I'm like a dgen that. through and through, um, but also try to be an excellent lawyer and advise my clients, um, As appropriate, and I'm here in Germany for my first time at the uh, Blockchains Conference. Blockchain Conference. I'm speaking tomorrow about DAOs, um, which is you know always a fun subject to talk about. But happy to talk about anything within the space. Okay, perfect. Uh, it sounds super interesting. I'm, uh, I'm wondering if you guys are based in Israel, uh, but you you well consult or you help clients, you advise clients basically all over the world, right? U.S., Israel, Europe yeah, yeah. as well, I guess, Asia. Um, Do you need subsidiaries in these countries or what, what's your... Do I personally yeah, as a law firm? Yeah, or your company yeah, as a no. law firm. Um, I, would, I would almost venture to say that in most cases, I don't even need to have a license to practice law for okay. most of what I'm doing. In fact, I have some colleagues who are um, very active in this space who have actually given back their legal licenses or put them on hold because oftentimes having a license to practice law gives you all kinds of ethical constraints that may be difficult to adhere to in this industry. Um, 
the only time that we would require a local license is really um, when we issue legal opinions. And so then if it's, in, in, if it's a jurisdiction where I personally am not uh, licensed, then we have partners in our team that we work with in almost every jurisdiction in the world that are able to issue those opinions. So rather than having to engage with like a million different law firms, it's very difficult to you know, find, find people who are competent in blockchain. What we do is we p- provide like a, uh, an umbrella of regulatory compliance and legal services. So for example, in Hamburg, um, I mean, I'm not licensed to practice law here, but I have a colleague and a friend who's an excellent lawyer who's based here to the extent that I would need anything local, we would bring him in as part of our team and he would provide the services directly. So we're, we're sort of a brand. Um, with a big ne- network as well. With I a guess. big network. Yeah. And, and, and I would say that that's our biggest asset. In addition to being fucking awesome at what we do, um, we also have in a network of like amazing people that where, where necessary are able to plug in the holes that we're not able to fulfill. And so we kind of just are able to guarantee that whatever you're getting from us is going to be... First of all, the full spectrum of what you need and also top-notch services. So basically, you're a lawyer, you're a degen, and in many cases, you just give an advice or some knowledge on topics which you understand naturally as a lawyer, but they are not, let's say, pro forma or, or, or officially legal advisors. Right. So I, I would tell you, we have um, a, a lot of general knowledge of the relevant uh, legal and regulatory frameworks that are applicable to um, companies that want to be active in this space, okay, which enable us to tell you what you need, where you need it, and when, okay. For the first question that people come to me is like, oh, where should I incorporate, okay? Uh, a lot of the guys that I met at, I this, believe that, at yeah. this conference, a lot of the booths are very tailored towards the blockchain industry in Germany, okay? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, that's true. a very narrow approach to take. Um, in the same way that you know we advise clients who are that that the clients themselves are in the U.S. or in Israel or in various places throughout the European uh, market, um, where you are as a person and where even where you're incorporated as a company doesn't have to say very much about how active or where you're active in this space, because a lot of these products are decentralized and because you want to make them available to a broad spectrum of individuals, so incorporating in Germany or focusing on the German market or being compliant in Germany isn't really helpful for you as a company. It's actually restricting you to a very small market. So what the real question you want to ask yourself is, how could I bring my product to as many people as possible, being at, um, mitigating um, my exposure to uh, financial regulatory markets to the greatest extent possible? And that's kind of the answer that we try and help people solve. So we tell you where, um, you tell me what your product is. You tell me where you want people to be able to access it. And we'll tell you, okay, based on your product, you know, you should set up your company here. You can have a, a token issuing company that's over here. You can make your platform accessible to these and these people, but your token should only be accessible to those and those people. Uh, you could do staking, but only if it's done in such, in other words, you tell me what you want to do. We'll tell you how you could do it. Rather than working the other way and saying, I have a company in Germany. What can a German company do? That's, that's a bit of a backwards approach, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah but I, I agree and I understand it. But is there a big difference really on the product that you're planning to launch, um, which really decides on where you actually set up your legal registration or your company registration? Because I could imagine that there is basically, let's say, a list of 10 countries where you just know they are the most regulatory crypto friendly countries and those 10 are always, well, let's say most suitable for most products. Okay. So I, I understand where you're coming from, but that's why I always say that there's no one size fits all for every client because it, it depends really what you're trying to build and who you're trying to attract. If you're trying to attract um, you know, enterprise level customers, banks and institutionals, then you need to get a, you're going to need to go through a much more expensive um, much more regulated route, okay? So you're going to go for, you're not going to want to set up a company in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. You're going to want to go for something that's like um, um, more high profile like Cayman, but it's also going to be more expensive. It's going to restrict your product in many ways in terms of what you can offer and who you can offer it to, but there's a trade-off to everything. So it really depends on like what your budget is, who you want to market to, 
and what your appetite is for uh, regulatory exposure. But isn't that always a point of critique also when it comes to how let's say blockchain or crypto related companies are seen in the public that it's always like well it's another company that's set up in the Caymans or in Malta or Cyprus or wherever just because you have a Cypriot or Cayman company it doesn't mean you could do whatever the fuck you want like you still need to um, in other words even if you have a company that does that 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 jurisdiction will allow you to do A, B, C if you do D then you're like You're, you're not covered by the umbrella that you that you incorporated under. So um, regardless of where you set yourself up, you need to have checks and balances, which is why, and here's my pitch, it's important to have a good lawyer on, on, your, on your side, somebody that you advise with regularly and is able to tell you where the landmines are so you make sure you don't step on them. Yeah, yeah, that does make sense. Are you mostly working then with larger companies or larger projects like enterprise customers? Because I could imagine that such advice can easily be... Well, I wouldn't want to say expensive because that's somehow the wrong word, but it ca it can take some You're time. You're not wrong. It's uh, it's our, our our services are not cheap, um, but I would say that they're a must. In other words, if you want to make money, you need to spend money. Um, and if you and I can't tell you how many times people come to me and they're like, "We launched this product. We didn't want to spend money on lawyers at the beginning, but now we made a shit ton of money. Help us to you know make this kosher." And then it's usually much more expensive to fix something that's broken than to start from scratch in a way that's, um, that, that's, that's, that's well thought out from the beginning. I would say that that's like one of the nicest things about being um, active in a bear market, that during a bull, everybody's coming and just throwing money at you. It's and chaos. Yeah, we'll do this yeah, yeah. and we'll do that and take tokens and take that. Anybody who's active in the market now is kind of taking a much more reserved approach towards what their products are. Nobody's just going and spending $100,000 on setting up a company and paying legal without knowing for sure or at, at a very high level of certainty that their product is going to be interesting to somebody. So the, the market is much more mature now in terms of the people who are still in it and still active and still have money going forward. Yeah, we're not cheap, but I think that you get a lot of bang for your buck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, for me, at least it feels like, I don't know, how, how is it, uh, is, would you say Israel is crypto friendly from a legislational point of view? Uh, from, from a... Or regulatory so, uh, point of we're, view. We're based in Israel, but we're very much not an Israeli law firm. Um, Israel is, is semi-crypto friendly. I think we have, like, the, you mentioned before that, like, we're the, you know, startup central. We, we, we really are. We have, like, a million unicorns. And also, it's no different in the crypto space. It's a very, very active community. There's, like, two crypto events a week. Um, I just came from this, the entire week now in Tel Aviv is uh, Solana Hacker House. There's, like, people coming in all day long. Lots of activity going on. So Israel is a great place for people to build crypto products. Okay, as it is with any industry almost. It's excellent for R&D purposes. Um, from a regulatory aspect, I think uh, regulation is still in its early stages. But Israel is one of the worst um, ecosystems for structuring a blockchain company um, because of its banking infrastructure. The banks in Israel are... To say that they're not crypto friendly would be the understatement of the century. Um, if you mention anything associated with crypto, they will shut down your account immediately. Okay, um, right. the, It's the only way that you're able to bring a dollar into a uh, Israeli uh, account from crypto is if you know your money was only ever went through a regulated exchange um, into the exchange's trading platform, stayed there forever came out through the same place that I went in and you were able to hand, the, hand over like a, a transaction uh, a, um, history of that exact thing that I detailed to you, then maybe they'll let you bring your money in. But it, it's, it's impossible. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm asking because it, I wouldn't know about Israel. That's why I've asked. But I, it feels like currently, at least in the US, there is a regulatory crackdown taking place i don't know if that's your perspective as a well what? Sorry? A crackdown like oh crackdown yeah crackdown on crypto the us I, i i honestly i feel bad for us markets right now i feel bad for anybody who built or is building in the us market excuse me um the us is in my opinion completely missing the boat as far as crypto is concerned um the mandate of the sec is to um the uh, securities and exchange commission 
is to protect American consumers. Retail consumers, right? Yeah. Um, and they're absolutely not doing their job, in my opinion. They're, um, they've set a vendetta on, against crypto companies. They've refused time and time again to cooperate with companies who want to be compliant locally. And yeah, what best it's example doing is, probably is, is Coinbase, is Coinbase I guess. Yeah. Yep. And it's just forcing them out of the um, out of the U.S. It's forcing them to um, set up, you know, quote unquote, shady uh, legal, legal yep. and regulatory yep. frameworks yep. elsewhere. And and U.S. consumers are starving for 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 crypto. They they want to be active. They want to continue being active, and it's forcing them to have to go elsewhere, um, be susceptible to frameworks that are not. Um, that are not going to fall under the scrutiny of the U.S. regulators, and they're going to get hacked, and they're going to lose their money. And you know, unfortunately, it's going to both um, harm U.S. consumers and harm harm U.S. companies who are no longer able to build within the United yeah. States. I mean, I remember Coinbase basically screaming and asking for proper regulations since a few years, and saying, "Guys, please regulate yeah. us within yeah, yeah. a certain I mean, frame." Like, Anybody who's not already following Brian Armstrong on Twitter, like you should do so immediately. He is one of the heroes of um, the U.S. crypto market, and what Coinbase are doing and is continuing to do is um, fighting the you know the big bad regulator who who really shouldn't be seen that way. Like the regulators should try yeah. and empower yeah. companies in the U.S. Try and work together with them in order to build a. Um, a, a, a strong and secure market within the United States and not driving people offshore. Kurze Pause. Wenn dir diese Folge von CryptoTicker gefällt, dann drück selber mal schnell die Pause-Taste und lass uns eine Bewertung und ein Subscribe da. Das hilft uns als Podcast ziemlich und wir freuen uns natürlich über jedes Feedback. Und wenn du nach der Folge noch mehr Insights und Infos brauchst, dann schau doch einfach mal auf CryptoTicker.io nach. Dort findest du alles rund um Kryptowährungen, Web3, NFTs und viele mehr. Bereits seit 2015 kümmert sich das Team von CryptoTicker darum, Neulingen und Profis eine Heimat im Kryptospace zu bieten. Auf CryptoTicker.io findest du jeden Tag neue Artikel und Insights, prall gefüllt mit News, Tipps und Hintergrundinfos. Im CryptoTicker Discord kannst du dich mit tausenden von Gleichgesinnten austauschen, Fragen stellen, Kontakte knüpfen und vieles mehr. Schau am besten gleich jetzt in die Shownotes, denn da findest du alle Links zu CryptoTicker und kannst direkt ein Teil der Community werden. Und jetzt weiterhin viel Spaß mit CryptoTicker, der Podcast. You are going to speak about setting up DAOs or how to set up a DAO, right? No, no. I'm speaking about DAOs, but not about how to set one up. Okay. And, Sorry, and, then uh, correct no, me. No, no, no. It's it's fine. Uh, the truth is, I'm not really sure what I'm speaking about yet. I've changed the subject of my talk time and time again because um, I love and hate the notion of a DAO. I think that there's so much promise in the idea of a decentralized autonomous organization and yet so much failure in its implementation. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Every time I hear the word DAO, I cringe because it's almost always used in the wrong con context. And um, I've not yet found a framework for establishing a DAO that I feel is the way to go forward because... It's still in its early early stages. I've almost never seen a DAO that's actually decentralized and autonomous. Um, yeah, I was just about to ask that because it feels for me always, whenever I hear from somebody explaining to me that they are a DAO, and I don't want to blame anybody, right? They, do, they are doing their best, I guess. But if the explanation is always like, okay, it, yeah, it's a semi kind of DAO because it doesn't really, yeah. there is no framework, yeah. as you were just saying. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it, it, the term is overused and it's and it's almost never used properly. And even those use cases where people are actually trying to set up a DAO and have a lot of money to throw at it, um, there isn't, there hasn't yet been a go to go to framework that's really worked and has been successful in establishing a a real a really good framework for decentralized autonomous organizations that can be copied. Um, Although, you know, we're trying, we're struggling, we're doing, we're working with several companies right now, setting up various um, DAO structures. Again, it's, I say various because it's almost never the same. Um, but I do believe in the idea of a DAO and I really want to see it into fruition. Um, I always, you know, my, my favorite, favorite example is like 
during the NFT craze last year, um, there were so many times where like I bought into an NFT project, joined their Discord, and then everybody's like, "Welcome to the DAO." Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember that as well. Yeah. Please <laughs> get me out of here. You know, like just because you have a voting mechanism in your Discord server, it doesn't mean that we're a DAO. Vote via and reaction. By saying that we're a DAO, you're bringing upon us all like. Um, you know, joint um, unlimited liability, which is not something that I necessarily want to be exposed to, especially since I don't even know you guys. <laughs> mm. But do you have a gut feeling on when there might be solutions available or frameworks available where you can really set up a DAO that, that, that actually holds true to its, well, promises? Or so I don't think it's an issue of like which jurisdiction is going to provide the answer. I think it's more an issue of working out the technical kinks of um, you know every DAO goes through nothing is fully decentralized from day one there's always this like process of gradual decentralization so um, okay, that's I an think interesting that, that thought. process needs to be um, improved and a big part of that is actually on the technical side there's a there's a lawyer who's very active in the space he's the general counsel for Delphi Labs which is a you know a very active VC in the space His name is Gabriel Shapiro. He's also very active on Twitter. And he recently um, proposed a new DAO structure. Um, it's also still in the ideation stage called the Cyborg. Recommend reading about it. Which is, um, it, it basically takes that, um, that stance I was talking about before, like focusing more on the technical side of like how to, you know, correct the tech to make it truly autonomous. Um, it's, 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 it's tough. You know, I was just talking to somebody inside. I don't want to use names. But one of the booths here, um, they were telling me how they have a DAO. And I was asking about it. And it sounded like he really... <laughs> That's your trigger no, question. <laughs> no, he knew, he, he knew his shit. Um, and it sounded like they had, they had done like a, a pretty good job in their structuring. But I was asking him, okay, so like, you know, tell me about governance. And he's like, oh, well, you know, we recently uh, were going to take a booth at the Bitcoin conference in Miami. And that was... Um, you know, it cost like $25,000 to sponsor a booth. And so we asked the, the DAO members, do you guys think we should do this or not? And that's real governance. That's allowing them to make decisions that are, that you know, that determine. But when I asked him about, you know, other things that were more prudent to the day-to-day -day operations of the, mm, yeah, of the yeah. company, um, you know, buying equipment, et cetera, that are, you know, way, way more expensive and have like, real impact um i asked him if those kind of things are brought to a vote and he said no no no, no. like we don't want to let 17 year old um ape holders make decisions that will determine the future of our company and that is not a DAO. yeah okay 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 well um what's your what's your message uh, anyways if, if people want to start something do you have like a core believe or core message or something which you can put out um, I would <laughs> I would say reach out to me on uh, Telegram. <laughs> um, it's I IJ Hammer, I-J-H-A-M-M-E-R, or via email. Um, my Our website is dltlaw.io. Um, I also have a podcast that talks about um, emerging technologies, um, specifically blockchain and AI. It's called Beyond the Code. You can find me on Spotify. And this has been a real pleasure having this conversation. Thank also, you if very you're a block chance, then come uh, listen to me tomorrow at five over there. I'm not really sure what the name of the stage is, but. <laughs> All right, I will share the links. No worries. All right, Thank you so cool. much for being Thank here. Thank you so much. It's been great. All the best. Cheers. Vielen Dank fürs Zuhören. Wenn dir die Folge gefallen hat, dann lass uns gerne ein Like da, klick auf Abonnieren, mach eine Bewertung und schau auf jeden Fall auch mal auf unsere Social Media Kanäle sowie den Newsletter. Dort findest du immer alle News rund um Kryptoticker der Podcast. Und jetzt einen schönen restlichen Tag, Abend oder Morgen und bis zum nächsten Mal.